I am here with the great Judy Hale uh, of ISPI fame, uh, author, performance improvement consultant, and, uh, and just thought leader all around. I'm thrilled to have drawn the, the, the straw to be the one to get the interview with Judy. So welcome to our uh, Learning and Development Giant series. Well, thank you, Matthew. It's really a, a real pleasure to be here. And I, you know, I do appreciate, you know, you're talking about my ISPI lineage or linkage or something. For those of you who don't know, I've been the past president, and, but I've been an active member since 1980. And I say that's longer than probably some of your audience has been on this earth. But so I've, I've been with them for a very long time, but I'm also known in other arenas as well. And uh, one of those has to do with credentialing. Um, my book on performance-based credentials is the leading reference book in the field of people building certifications, accreditations, certificate programs, things like that. And uh, I uh, have been part of that community for the same amount of time. I joined them also in 1980. So that's another arena that some people have uh, either met me, heard me speak, or have read my materials or things like that. So that's, that's what's happened. But I, uh, today, I basically, um, I'm going to turn this off. You may not be able to hear it, but I can. Uh, today, and well, still today, uh, the majority of my work is in the credentialing arena. And what distinguishes me, however, is my performance improvement side. So I, I, I'm not somebody who just looks at, did they pass the test? I wanna know if because they're certified, did something change? Uh, an, a simple way of looking at it is if you wanted to certify people who save puppies, you better show that your certification, there were fewer puppies that died or more puppies were saved. So I am, the credentialing industry does not look at external validity at all. They only look at internal validity. And I am the one outlier out there. There might be a couple more, but I don't know them yet that has insisted that we link our credential to some larger good. And we'll be able to demonstrate a correlation that because of our certification, something else has happened that way. To me, that makes sense. And that something doesn't always have to be uh, a business outcome. It can oh, be no, no, a greater no. outcome to society, to yes. the environment. Right, right. One of my projects was with uh, certifying people who um, prescribe wheelchairs. Now, we think of that as simply just put people in a wheelchair and move them around. Well, in parts of Africa, <clears throat> uh, one in five is dependent on a wheelchair. And they don't have roads, so that wheelchair has to be maneuvered down dirt paths and they use that wheelchair to drive their livestock to do their farming so you you better really know what's going on and so that wheelchair has to be engineered for rough terrain things like that and the patient him or herself has to know how to fix it because it breaks in fact one of the tests questions was how do you leap your wheelchair over a fallen branch Wow. And we don't even think about that here in, in the Americas at all, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so those are the things that if you can't show that because of your credential, more people have access to those. And because of that access, they're able to tend their fields, take care of their livestock, run their businesses. What good is it? Yeah. There's been a lot of talk lately about certifications and credentialing in our field. And given some of the current discourse around it, is there a difference between certification and credentialing? Credentialing is a broader term. So credentialing frequently means you, you have an academic degree, you know, master's degree, bachelor's degree. Credentialing encompasses certificates that you get. Uh, so credentialing is like the umbrella term. And then a, a credential, a certification is one type of credential, does that help you? <clears throat> but there is a real growth in this area, absolutely. And uh, 
what we're finding is that, well, the, it's the Georgetown uh, University's research showed we're, we're over a million people are being certified every year. Wow. Cred Credly is the largest bestower of credentials, certificates, certifications, badges, okay? And there's someone going onto their website every second of every business day to either apply or retrieve their credential. How does one determine whether a credential is valid or, um, or acceptable? Well, uh, there's certainly the whole issue of face validity, who's bestowing it, right? Does it make sense? And part of that is uh, the, the standards or requirements that you have to do to get it. I mean, some, some are simple. You just, your check has to clear, you know, <laughs> and you've got it, honey. That's, that's it. You know, if, you're, if your money's good, you're certified. Uh, but, um, but some have very rigorous requirements and uh, those usually involve an assessment, not necessarily a multiple choice test, but an assessment. My roofers, for example, as you imagine, their, their test is all hands-on. They actually have created mock-ups and they have to demonstrate that they can properly cut, lay out, measure, seal, you know, fasten, and the whole thing. And they have like an eight by eight size, eight feet, at, well, not huge. It's not a, they're not on a real roof because you have issues about their falling and getting hurt. Uh, that's a very high face validity kind of, of a, a test because it really is their ability to do the thing like that. They're, they also have a safety, they have, they have to wear the safety gear and <clears throat> they have to check their gear before they're out. Even though they're not on a roof, they're on the ground, they have to pretend, it's as if they were on a roof. And if they make one safety mistake, they fail. So there's, oh. it's a very unforgiving, you know, because that mistake could cost you your life on the roof. Do you think that people in our field, in, in the performance improvement field and training uh, should have credentials? That's kind of a leading question, Matthew, but I, I'll jump. I know. I'm sorry. No, no, I couldn't help. Like, they're getting credentials. They're getting certificates in the technology delivery systems. All of that uh, articulate, you know, you, you name, uh, all the storyline, all you, there's 30 some of them. And that's good because then the customer knows they know how to use the technology. Here's the bad side. They don't know anything about learning science. So I, I audit that work. I get hired by clients to audit their training and I am seeing horrible stuff claiming that it's, it's helping people get skills and knowledge. And it, it it's, it not to say it violates the rules. It doesn't even know rules exist. It's like random nonsense. I've never, there's no structure or anything, but boy, they know how to do the delivery technology piece. See, so I would say to you that yes, people in our field should have a credential. Now that could be a baccalaureate degree in our field. That could be a master's degree or doctorate degree or it could be a certification. And I do have a certification. It's the certified developer of training. And this really, you have to, it's a portfolio basis. You have to show that you have considered the realities of the bill, can they sustain it? Did you in really push practice application? Did you think through beyond that learning event, how it's gonna work? Uh, did you get people to get feedback on how they're doing? So it has all the learning principles in it. And um, so I would say, yes, we need a credential, not a credential, but we need to confirm that the people we're hiring to design, develop our curriculum are actually no learning science. They, they know that part. Now, his, historically, you were quite involved in creating the CPT for ISPI, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. the, the CPT, uh, uh, a majority of the people in, who, who have that, their work is in learning, whatever. 
but they don't have to be. We have pharmacists who have that certification. We have fire marshals. We have some weird lots. I mean, but they're people who take a systematic process, a uh, view of what they're doing. They consider it and they actually set metrics and, and show improvement in what they're doing, right? Yeah. So yeah. my, I earned that certification and my application was my work in credentialing certifications and how my certifications made a difference what they're doing. So I didn't use it with the learning solution. So, but that's okay. That's it. Well, let me uh, transition to the question that, that mm -hmm. we're asking all of the giants. Uh, what is the one area of research that all l and practitioners should be aware of? Well, I think it's going to be about bias. It, it's and how we induce bias in the design of our learning solution. Now, bias comes about with sampling error. We ask the wrong people. We don't ask enough people. We don't have diversity of voice. That's the first area of bias. The second area of bias has to do with asking ill-formed questions, okay? The, the questions themselves, whether it be on a survey or they be in an interview or whatever, in fact, lead people to an answer versus really uncover and discover and validate. Another area of, of bias is content. We ask the wrong kinds of questions and infer something else. So I ask you about your roses and I infer that you know something separate from that. And I see lots of that. We're seeing a lot of bias. And that's one of the issues now in education, like what, what's in the curriculum. Well, if you know, 41 states don't teach civics, Matthew. So then, you know, I would say then you've induced a bias in the fact that how people address their citizenry and how they understand what that role is. So if I don't teach you <clears throat> certain things, I have distorted history, okay? So I think we need, as a professionals, we need to understand how bias is introduced and so that we can make sure that we're not introducing that bias. It can be as simple as designing your training. You know, you always ask the A plus and once you ask the A plus people. Well, the A plus people have long since forgotten what they know. So you need to ask somebody closer who remembers why they do what they do and how, and they don't take the shortcuts. We also need to include the voice of the recipients of the work. Because people who know, do the work will tell you what to do. The recipients of the work will tell you what they should do. So I think we need to be much more disciplined in understanding how our methods can in fact induce bias. And we need to be more rigorous in our processes. I love that perspective. You know, we've been thinking so much about cognitive biases, uh, but what you're talking about is so much more practical and, and actionable. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I know that in my designing certifications, I frequently ask who hates you? And they'll tell me, I said, well, let's invite them. Well, we can't talk to them. <laughs> well, I certainly, maybe we should talk to them. <laughs> so one of the groups, I asked them who hated them. And they said, fire marshals. I said, well, I think we should find out why fire marshals hate us. And sure enough, these are people who, who specify uh, furnitures finishing fixtures and things. And we found out the fire marshal said they put stuff on the walls and the windows and the floors that when the fire happens, they emit toxins and the toxins kill you before we can get, save you. The fire doesn't kill you. And they had never thought about toxins in materials. Okay, so let's uh, talk about that. So, I, so that's what I'm talking about. It, that's a sampling error. We talk to the people we like. We talk to the people who agree with us. We talk to the people who are already on board. That's wonderful. There's no innovation. You know, there, there's, we're, we're perpetuating historic bias in that process. Judy, can I ask you uh, for some advice for our new folks in the field? We have a lot of students and young people who are just getting into learning and development. And uh, uh, what piece of advice do you have for them? 
<laughs> I would, my piece of advice to the young people coming in is to hear the oldsters and respect them, but understand that they bring a perspective. You don't have to buy it 100%, but you have to honor it, okay? And in honoring it, they will be less likely to fight you downstream. They're more likely to support your innovative ideas and your change. But if they feel discounted, they entrench. And then now you have resistors in what you're doing. So, I mean, that I hope that makes sense. But I think when, when you are going into a company, you're bringing fresh eyes and you're bringing your academic background. And you see things they don't see, and that's good. But don't start pointing out immediately all of their blemishes. They are where they are because they did something right for a long time. Now they need to do something different to stay right. And you have to let them be willing to let go of the past to accept the new. It's funny. Uh, I have a hard time thinking that what they need to do is let go. I'm still following them. <laughs> well, we it's hard to let go when you know it's worked in the past. Yeah. Okay? So, and it doesn't mean you should let go of everything. What What's the fundamental premise behind it? But you need to somewhat visit, is it still relevant or is it still the best today? So we have to be open to these new ideas, yes. Judy, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to interview with me and have a conversation with me. It was my pleasure and my honor, and I hope your listeners and viewers find this a worthwhile. I can't imagine they won't. So thank you so much. Thank you.